previous session, I described to you the project management process as it is described in the PIMBOK. In this section, I will describe you 10 steps that you can follow to initiate, plan, execute and close a project and repeat success. The 10-step approach is a simple guide that you can use, but you have to be aware that not all elements and processes as described in the PIMBOK are included in these steps. Quality procurement, stakeholder and communications management are not described here at all or just mentioned shortly. We will look deeper into the steps that are part of the different project management process steps like initiation, planning, execution, monitor and control, and finally closing. The different elements that will be described in the following slides can be used as a checklist to be completed. Once all elements are checked, you are sure you covered 90% or more of all processes to be completed. The goal of this presentation is to provide you with a set of 10 clear and simple steps to guide you through a project and deal with the main items to complete. Of course, as mentioned before, not all elements have been included, but a 10-step approach is a concise guide and is sufficient to start with projects and understand what work has to be completed to complete a project successfully. Based on the project management process, the process steps and the processes they include, you can use this checklist to include the most important items. You can consider the 10-step approach as a simple guide to complete, define, plan, execute, monitor and control and close a project. In addition to this list, you may have to include elements related to quality, procurement, stakeholders and communications management to improve the performance. The first process step or initiation is all about project definition. In this step, the project charter is developed, preferably with the help of an experienced project manager and using a PMI-compliant template. During this step, the main stakeholders are identified. This may be very early in the project, but it's important to understand who these st stakeholders are and how they stand towards the project. I just want to remind you that stakeholders can be very important and can influence projects in positive but also a negative way. Forgetting stakeholders may create problems, hence this is a step that not has to be taken without consequences, it has to be taken seriously. After initiation we will start with planning but only when the project charter has been approved. Planning can be split into seven steps that have to be executed in order. All steps together will lead to the project plan, but like I mentioned before, items related to quality, procurement, stakeholders and communication are not included here. Of course, you can always add these additional elements while following the 10 steps. Step two of the 10-step process is about defining the requirements, the scope, create the work breakdown structure and the activities. The requirements have to be specified based on the content of the business case, statement of work or feasibility study. A requirement register will be built, including the requirements and the person or functions or function that requested them. It is important to have this information and the project manager has to verify if the requirements are compliant with the project goal. Based on the requirements, it is possible to determine the work that has to be completed to finish the project. This leads to the scope of the project and has to be approved by the project sponsor and or client. With the requirements and the scope, the project team can build a work breakdown structure, which is a hierarchical overview of the project and should only contain the work included in the scope. According to the PIMBOK, the lowest level of the WPS is related to the work packages. But in real life, these are not detailed enough to plan the work in detail. Before continuing with the next step, it is important to identify all the activities that have to be completed. 
Although there is a clear difference between work packages and activities, in some cases, for smaller projects, the activities can be the same as the work packages. Once step two is completed, we can continue with step three. Since we identify the different work packages or activities and exactly know what has to be done, we can identify the necessary skills and resources needed to do the work. We can also assign roles and responsibilities to the people who are assigned to the activities, see further in resources allocation, and estimate the effort and duration of the activities. In step four, we will build the precedence diagram, and in order to do this, we have to determine how the different activities are linked. This is called the precedence information, and for example, defines a finish to start relationship between activities. Understanding the precedences, sorry, understanding the precedences and knowing the duration of the activities, it is possible to create a precedence diagram. The precedence diagram can be developed in different ways. Basically, we have the activity on the arrow, AOA, and activity on the node. Today, the AON, or activity on the node methods and the precedence diagramming method, PDM, are the most widely used diagramming methods, but you can still find activity on the arrow, or AOA diagramming methods, like the arrow diagramming methods. In today, the AON methods and the precedence diagramming method, PDM, are the most widely used diagramming methods, but you can still find AOA diagramming methods like the arrow diagramming method. In this course, I will concentrate on the AON and PDM. Once the precedence diagram has been created, we can calculate the start and finish times of all activities, determine the slack or float, and identify the critical path. Step 5 is about creating the project schedule and the Gantt chart. This is basically placing the activities on a calendar-like schedule. The Gantt chart was developed in 1917 and is a very interesting tool that is still used by project managers. In step 6 and 7, we will use the Gantt chart to add resources to the activities and create the project budget. In step 6, we add the resources and evaluate their utilization and resolve issues. An issue is when a resource is over allocated during specific period. Resolving resource problems is important and we may have to reschedule activities. Once all conflicts have been resolved, the schedule and resource baseline can be created and the schedule baseline will be used in step 7 to create the budget. Adding the costs to all activities and adding them per period results in the creation of the time-based and cumulative budget. The cumulative budget is also called the S-curve and will be used later to follow up the project for earned value management. The S-curve is also the budget baseline. The final step in planning, step 8, is risk management. Basically, elements of risk management are created during the entire planning process step and in step 8 we will bring all elements together. After completing step 8 and eventually redoing previous steps, the project management plan has been created, all baselines have been completed, and now we can decide what to do with the project. Will we continue or not? Once we decide to continue, we can go to the execution and monitor and control. During execution, we start creating the deliverables, and we have to monitor how the work is done. An important part of project execution is to compare the actual situation with the baselines and see how the project is performing. Executing a project without monitoring and controlling should not be done. We have to verify how the work is progressing in order to update timings and costs. Once we start executing a project, we have to make sure that we are still within the boundaries of the business case like timings and finance. Monitor and control we will provide also information on how we have to continue with the project 
or even decide to kill it. Step 10 is about project closing and is a part of the closing project step of the project management process. Closing is important and should not be forgotten. During closing, we gather all the information about the project for later use and prepare the project for transition to the next step, like operations. Closing includes processes like creating the as-built plans, conducting lessons learned sessions, knowledge management, project success evaluation, and not to be forgotten, that is also the time to mention people or teams who contributed in a special way to the project. Some elements of closing are very useful for the project and should be shared with the team to apply it as soon as possible. Some lessons we learn can be useful for the ongoing project and in that case should, they should be shared immediately with all the participants to assure maximal effectivity. Closing is a very important step and should not be forgotten. <clears throat> closing is a very important is very sorry. Closing is very important and should always be the last step of any project or phase. Once closing is completed, the project team members can be released. Of course, we do not have to keep all team members until closing, just the people that are still needed. But be careful, once resources have been released, they may, may not be available for your project if you would need them again. This was the overview of the 10-step process that will help you define, plan, execute and close projects in an efficient way and be successful. This concludes this session. The elements I provided will help you to deal with projects in an easy way. Let us continue with the next session and I'm looking forward to seeing you there.